Welcome to the Wall Street Lab podcast, where we interview top financial professionals and deconstruct their practices to give you an insider look into the world of finance. Hello and welcome to episode number 26 of the Wall Street Lab podcast. And today we are back to venture capital. Andy, why don't you introduce our today's guest? Hi, everyone. We're going to talk with Tobias Schulz, who is an investment manager at HTGF, which is short for Hightech Gründerfonds. For all of you non-Germans, that's by number of investments, the biggest venture capital company in Germany and one of the largest in Europe. Tobias, before joining HTGF, founded his own company and worked previously also in private equity. Yeah, and we're talking about really interesting stuff, including the differences between the European and US venture capital market, the scalability of startups in different territories, how do investment managers make decisions in venture capital, and how do they judge startups that they invest in, as well as some things like how do you get a job as a VC and differences between private equity and venture capital, and especially working for private equity and venture capital funds, because there are quite a few. So before we jump into the interview, we would like to invite you to give us a five-star rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, which helps us enormously in growing this show. Short disclaimer, just to let you know, the way how I got to meet Tobias is through one of the companies I co-founded, as had to give is an investor into that company. And now, without further ado, let's jump in. Hello, everyone, and warm welcome from the WeWork offices here in Frankfurt. I am sitting here with Tobias, and we're going to be discussing venture capital today. Hi, Tobias. How are yes. you doing? Hi, Lucas. Um, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for your invitation. Great. So we usually start these interviews with a short introduction to, to your mm -hmm. personal background. And as we're going to be talking about VC, I believe many people would want to learn a lot about what is your background and how did you get into VC becoming before becoming an actual investment manager? Yeah. So during my studies, I made a short side into investment banking. So this was in the days, in the years 2008, 2009, and not the best days uh, to do investment banking. So I decided to rather look further into startups. Yeah. So um, after my studies, I went to work for a large uh, e-commerce fashion retailer in Berlin as an entrepreneur in residence. From that on, I decided, well, I will learn something here for one or two years and then I will fund my own startup, which I did. So after those two years in Berlin, I founded my own startup for um, three and a half years. So basically, I had a feeling it shot to the moon and then it also went down nearly as fast <laughs> as it went up. So I decided I need to, to do something else and I still felt a bit attached to the financial sector but I wanted to stay in, in the startup ecosystem. Um, so for me it was just a natural development from finance and startup to go into venture capital and combine both. Mm -hmm. How do you think that being an entrepreneur in residence compares to uh, being an, an, an entrepreneur and starting something of your own? Do you think there are any differences there? I actually do think there are differences. So when you are an entrepreneur and starting it on your own, as an entrepreneur in residence, basically you're not as much attached to a company as you are when you are the founder. You know, If you're the founder, you are the managing director, you hold much more responsibilities for uh, the employees, um, uh, to the investors and to all different sides. So the, let's call it the emotional attachment of a founder is is much stronger than of an entrepreneur in residence. Mm -hmm. So now you're working at Hightech Gründerfonds as an investment manager. Could you tell us a little bit about what is Hightech Gründerfonds and what it is that you do? Sure. So Hightech Gründerfonds, or yeah, the short form HTGF, is a seed investor. We are one of the most active and biggest seed investors in Europe with 900 million assets under management. Um, also, as maybe a speciality, we are a public-private partnership. That means we have money from the German government as well as money from large corporations that we invest in. Um, typically, as a seed investor, you invest in early-stage startups. That means the startups should not be older than three years. 
um, we prefer to be the first real investor um, or go together with other investors, but it must be in, an, in a very um, early phase. And as the name high tech already shows, we like technology companies, so we mm -hmm. go into tech. So I believe you're one of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest, investor in terms of invested companies in Germany. Is that correct? That's that's correct. Um, also in in Europe, we are with already more than 500 companies that we invested in. Um, the biggest, the most active investor, and um, also did so far more than 100 exits, uh, which is also in the in the top notch um, of the of the venture capitalists. How do you manage such a huge portfolio? Could you tell us a little bit about the about the structure? Is there several people assigned to several companies, mm -hmm. or how do you scale this operation? Yeah, excellent question. So, this this large number, of course, needs a good structure, and um, we always have deal teams, which means you have two investment professionals together on a team, which is also the, called the four I principle. Yeah, so, um, one investment manager manages from the first investment until the exit, a company, but there's also always a second person double checking all all the decisions and all the the um, things going on in that company. So this is internally how we always structured. Then we also have people helping us. Our controlling is helping us with with numbers, yeah, you know, reportings and so on and so on. We also have. Um, relationship management that helps us if we maybe need a management addition or whatsoever. So we provide all the resources and we have quite a large team. So the whole fund has 60 people. Mm -hmm. From that, 35 investment professionals and 25 are just people that support us in, in managing that. So every investment manager has roughly about 10 companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And do these companies often work together? Do you look for synergies? They have some cases of when you know one company helps out the other. Uh, does that happen often? That ha happens quite often. I mean, it always depends. So in the end, every entrepreneur is uh, responsible for himself and can decide how much he wants to cooperate with others and use experience or not. We provide large uh, um, events where we can help portfolio startups to come together. So we have a family day with more than 1,000 um, um, people coming where our portfolio meets other investors and of course portfolio meets portfolio. So sometimes mm -hmm. founders have the same issues, whatever it is. Then they know well we have the same investors, they have something in common and then we provide them these events where they can talk to each other and we also have a Slack channel, for example, so mm -hmm. they can all meet on our HEGF Slack and have short private messages and are quite busy also mm -hmm. um, um, asking questions and getting answers there internally. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So let's deep dive a little bit into the VC environment. Yeah. So as one of the largest investors in, in Germany, you have a very broad overview of what's going on in the market. So I'd love to pick your brain a little bit and talk about the different areas that you find interesting because we've been seeing a lot of movement in, in uh, places like e-mobility, e blockchain, mm -hmm. prop tech, all these spaces were uh, quite widely covered by investors. What is something that you look forward to and what trends do you see in the market? Yeah, so to the first question, there, the general trend is the market is extremely strong for venture capital. That means more and more capital is raised by VCs more and more people are privately going into that area as a business angel. And, and that, of course, goes on the valuation. So good companies um, have higher valuations these days than they had, I don't know, five years before. But also, on the other hand, there's more money, but there's also more startups. Mm. Because nowadays, it's, it's quite common to found your own startup, to have a startup. You know, we're here in this WeWork, look around. Yeah, all <laughs> people trying to get lucky um, as, with their own business which I think is a very good development. But so there's more money, but there's also more startups. So in a way, the ecosystem, probably the, 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 the percentage of getting funding is the same. Re with regards to your second question, well, what is interesting these days, as you're in e-mobility, definitely, uh, we see a lot of um, things happening there for Germany as a strong car manufacturer marketing market. One of the very important topics for the future, because you have today... A lot of old-fashioned engines, yeah, mm. with diesel and so on, 
and uh, the future as it looks today will go into electric drive so the, the manufacturers also want to go there because they have to film some governmental regulations but the infrastructure is not there yet so people basically don't buy electric drive now because well on the one hand there are not too many electric cars today but on the on the other hand the infrastructure is not good enough so you want to know that you can get from a to b um, and your battery can still remain full mm -hmm. so we find this is a very very interesting topic these days e-mobility and this is a market for a seed investor you know you always have to be early so um, we see that the market window is now now we are in the last year of that window being open mm -hmm. if you if you go into immobility in three years it's too late mm -hmm. the market is distributed right now so you need to to get a position here right now that's that's great i would love to follow up on that because uh, i know you have some very interesting things going on with immobility so jump back into this any other sectors that you find interesting well what's what's always interesting is the blockchain sector this is But this is basically a technology, so the question is, would you call it a sector? But everything where blockchain can be implemented, also in e-mobility, of course, it can be implemented. Quite interesting points coming up. And what I personally like is also uh, tax tech. So a part of legal tech is tax tech, you know, because taxation is not getting simpler, it's getting more and more complex. And with the digital business, The, the old-fashioned tax laws don't work anymore, mm -hmm. you know? They even struggle with um, small Amazon uh, um, uh, merchants who are, who are selling in, in 20 countries and need to file and register taxes here and there. So this is a clear, a clear market opportunity here because you, you need to develop a technology to, to get things done tax-wise as a company. So I think tax tag is also a very interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I remember there was a great uh, Free Economics podcast episode on uh, on taxation and how uh, the tax forms are designed and how much research goes into designing the tax form to cover every single possibility. But now with the technology developing, with the online sales and even digital assets coming into play, the taxes get more and more complicated. It's a, it's a, I think it's a great place to, to be at, to be providing services for these things. Yeah, it does. For example, we last year invested, or actually in, in December 2017, invested into Textu, a tech startup from Hamburg. They, they usually help the, the small merchants who are, for example, selling On the, in their own shop and on Amazon and everywhere else and with one click of a button then can sell in 25 countries. Mm -hmm. And even if they use, for example, Amazon FBA, they're not sure mm -hmm. from what store storage their mm -hmm. merch, where their warehouse actually is, so where, where their products are sent from. And this has a lot of tax implications. So um, for a normal um, tax accountant these days, it's very difficult to to service those merchants mm -hmm. because they can, with the click of a button on Amazon, get a enormous complexity in terms of taxes. And then if you if you are able, if you have the, the knowledge in tax, if you have someone that can design a software that gets all the tax implications, if, and of course, if you have someone that can sell this software with the knowledge, you're in a very good market position because in the end, when, when it comes to a startup, you always have to think about the usability so can people really use it how strong is the usage of 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 my software and you know there there's um, certainly a lot of usage in in implementing a software here where you probably then just have to add an api key and, and suddenly you get your taxes done whereas the old accountant needs to check a lot of stuff and and this will be like 10 hours of accountant versus two minutes of software going through it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is a very interesting topic. And as we all know, taxes will stay forever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, uh, that's true. So on that topic of, of investments into, into companies, uh, every VC, every investor has their own due diligence processes, has their own processes for choosing the companies. What is something that you as an investment manager look at in particular when you're looking at potential investment targets and, and companies yeah good question and, and maybe maybe to start with very simple you look for the introduction 
you know, because for example with HGF, all our portfolio, you see who investment manager is managing what kind of portfolio, you see the emails. So are they are they just sending out mass emails so you know you're one of those 100 guys, other VCs receiving it? Is it a targeted approach? Yeah? So maybe that's the first thing. The second, of course, are the founders. Um, and there, there's, there's no thing like age or um, education that really triggers, but it's it's in a way the the vita, you know, what what have they done in the past? Um, how did they get there? How close are they also related to their project? So did you just came up with it one one night, or uh, do you see that um, they already have quite a knowledge, or a specialized knowledge maybe in that area, which they found uh, so uh, um, important to say well. Uh, I see I see a gap here in the market or I see a big need and um, with my specialized knowledge I can serve that need so I need money to scale it so that's what we are basically looking for uh, so not the people that are thinking um, well I, I found a company to have a company but people who really know uh, why they do it and who have, a, who have a great idea and a great mind and are leaders mm. uh, and have, are, are nice also to, to hang around with so have a, a winning personality. Mm -hmm. And on on that note, I think for our listeners, what's also important is that as you have a tech name, uh, tech uh, word in your name uh, that implies you're investing in technology companies, and technology companies have this ability to scale. In many cases, it is not possible to scale a hardware company to the same extent uh with so little cost as scaling a software technology company, right? Yeah. So I would imagine this is also a big focus uh, for you. It definitely is. I mean, I must admit, we, we also um, make hardware investments. So it's not only on um, um, how hard it is to scale. We like everything that makes the world a little bit, bit better. And, you know, when you have a good product, even if, an, if it's an expensive and hard to scale hardware, if the market has a need for it, you will find someone that finances it. So we basically are there for the first prototypes, for the first assessment of the need in the market. That's where we invest. So really the, the real venture deals uh, mm -hmm. where you have high risk, high return. That's our area. And of course, we like businesses that can scale fast. So with technology, luckily, mostly you can scale fast. You know, It's something different when you... I don't know, have a, a franchise where you need good premises um, that might be difficult to scale. So with hardware on an app that can be downloaded a million times and um, we really see that the potential there is much, much higher than in, in old-fashioned businesses. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so on that point, I mean, uh, with so many companies that you have in your portfolio, What are some of the issues that you see entrepreneurs struggling with? So do you see anything that kind of changed over the last years that are some new problems arising that entrepreneurs are facing? Well, one of the, one of the things you have today is complexity. So you need to be a very well worst mind today to, to manage um, a software company or a startup with some tech angle because you need to have a basic understanding of the technology otherwise your engineers can tell you everything without you knowing does it really take that long to develop or not and you need to have a good business sense because otherwise your investors might say well where are these numbers coming from and you what kind of budget can you provide so you need to have some tech angle some business angel angle and of course you also need to be able to find good people which means you need to staff well you need to have a personality of of the ceo with something from the cto and from all the other areas i mean it always depends of course on the founding team but anyway all those qualities need to be in one company today i think i think the complexity is something that is today much much higher than than it was i don't know 10 years ago 15 years ago um also The, the development process are, are very fast. You know, it's very mm -hmm. fast to, to keep track with the newest technology, with the newest developments, uh, and so on and so on. So I guess um, that's the challenge of these days to focus. 
That's a very fair point. And also to add to that, we've been seeing so many companies that who create products that are so niche and yet are so widely used because they're implemented in other larger scale products. It's interesting to see that uh, there are specializations being developed in each of these niches. And in order to compete, you have to have, you have, to have something special. And this is where this complexity layer really comes into play. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're just uh, a me too business and doing what's, what someone else does, which will never get you there. So you need to really have a competitive edge. How do I say a USP mm -hmm. and the more the better, um, but still be able to handle this complexity and this new thing. Um, so that that's the channel, the challenge of today. Mm -hmm. So in terms of challenges, when a startup pitches you an idea for the, for the startups, what is something that I should not say when I'm pitching a startup to you. Uh, what's uh, what's something that you know? Uh, I mean, you can you can say everything. So um, what I what I think is the most important is to be honest and to be natural, you know, authentic. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing because it's a pitch is for both sides. I always say you know people think always well those are the ones that decide, but I think it's a, a mutual um, agreement that has to be. Uh, made here one day so the the entrepreneur should choose his investors and the investor the entrepreneur and both have to be fine so i think first of all don't think um, um i get something and i need to make up some 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 stories or whatsoever be normal be authentic um show what you have of course there are there are something which we where we say oh um, we need to uh, uh to look at this deeper i of course things from the cap table you know um If you, if you feel the salary is the most important um, aspect for the founder, those are points that, that need to be clarified. Also, um, yeah, you look for the IP, intellectual property. Is it well managed? Do people know about intellectual property? And is it within the company or is it on, on, on some other colleague who's still working at some other company? There, there are certain points we look to, but you are always free to, to say everything to a VC that you like, because as I said, it's, it's, um, both people have to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. So I would like to step back a little bit now. We've been discussing the, the trends in the, in the industry. I wanted to deep dive a little bit into, into some portfolio companies that, uh, that you, have, you have been working with. So we've been talking about e-mobility. Uh, I think a really cool example of uh, how the space is changing is um, uh, one of your companies, Wirelane. Uh, yeah. uh, can, you, can you tell us a bit more about it? Uh, I find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wirelane is an um, um, e-mobility provider that is basically trying to give the whole package. So what means the whole package these days? It means hardware and software as, as one system. And, you know, in the past, when you think about charging stations for electric vehicles, there were these, I call them stupid boxes where you can just plug in and then it says, well, how much energy it used. But the future, it will be of, of smart um, um, charging stations. Uh, we call them e-shell or whatsoever. And this means you want to make sure, well, where's the space available and you have a load balancing, you want to know how to pay. The best thing is you don't even have to pay. It will recognize your card. It will recognize maybe your phone via Bluetooth is closed. There's, it will recognize by radar when, when the, the, the charging station is blocked or not blocked. And this all needs to be then also for example for the... Um, business side so if you have a, a, a parking lot for businesses let's say where employees have their cars 10 hours a day well maybe they want to charge and maybe they don't want to pay for the charge because it's a company car and this all needs to be implemented so the, so the next step it, there will be smart e-mobility boxes and um, we decided to invest into wirelane a startup from munich because it provides a lot of more usage for the customers then there's available these days and um, especially in in the future when when you know if you look at the the big car manufacturers in 2019 2020 they have a lot of cars with electric uh, uh, motors electric engines and this will be the future so uh, we we decided to help building an infrastructure for these 
new dimensions of um, transport coming up and this needs to be smart so they need to be smart boxes you don't want to hassle anymore you want to reserve you, if you drive to into Franklin you want to reserve a spot and um, with your mobile phone pay for it nowhere to park and um, have it loading uh, while you're shopping or something like that or while even you are on your work and then having the the payment to be done seamlessly mm -hmm. that would be perfect uh, especially in frankfurt where we <laughs> suffer from lack of parking spaces yeah yeah that sounds that sounds interesting i think there was a the really cool uh a while back i think it might have been already a few years back when tesla released this um this device where you can drive up with your car to it and it just automatically plugs into the car uh that reminds me of that uh the, i bet there is a youtube video that will plug uh, somewhere in the in the show notes but yeah so what else has been going on in the in the german startup scene well, what are some startups that you're really excited about well you see a lot of transactions in in the startup scene so you know we are still missing the Google, Amazon, or Facebook in Germany, yes. because this is the outcome of what has been done in German VC 15, 20 years ago. So the market was not really existent. And um, you see today, we are, we are not in, in these hundreds of million um, um, euro rounds, but the rounds are getting bigger and bigger. And we are trying to attract more and more um, um, money, also foreign money, which basically from UK and US can, can do bigger tickets. Still, in my opinion, too much of the very good technology that we support is been sold to the US. Mm -hmm. So it seems like they are more open-minded for new technology and have to also deeper pockets. And um, they look to Europe to, to really get good uh, technology mm -hmm. for quite a money. So this still needs to be looked at in mm -hmm. the future. Yeah, that also entrepreneurs really wanting to make things big. You know, if you look mm. into the DAX, uh, the German stock exchange, except for SAP, which is uh, from 1977, the rest is all more than 100 years old. So we are really in a very old economy, which worked so far. But you feel now that every company, basically, so every corporate wants to change there. And you feel that also in venture capital, every Every week there's a new accelerator coming up. I don't know if that's a good development. It's good for startups anyway, but you need to have knowledge in that space to really be efficient, really support your companies. So it's not it's not only a numbers game. It's a game of connections, of network, and of find, finding the, the good startups and then finding them early and helping them to grow. Mm-hmm. I think there is also an aspect of, of scalability. Uh, when we were talking about the German VCs, you mentioned that uh, a lot of the ideas are going towards US, I think because of the unified language and unified laws across states, especially when it comes to startups. Uh, it seems more easy to scale a startup within the US with larger population rather than scaling across countries within Europe, which still have different laws and different operations. Yeah. I mean, it might might be true for some cases, you know, because you have just more people um, and, as you said, one language, one style, so it might be easier to scale it in the US and then they have a critical mass and then they have maybe enough cash flow to look into Europe for acquisitions. But I wouldn't neglect the, the European market, which is all Europe is also very big uh, if, you, if you look into the whole world. Mm -hmm. And... Um, You can you can always go to the USA. I think it's more in the US. They are they, they simply have more capital for ventures. You know, it has also something to do with um, they have uh, pension funds mm -hmm. and they have uh, um, I don't know maybe large university endowment funds yes. who provide venture capital. And if you see at the really the really really large rounds, you know, those, those come from those kind of. Um, um, funds you know, who just need to implement their money somewhere so this will be in the future and is the US uh, the better market I would say maybe because of that reason slightly better but but Europe is catching up so fast I can imagine in five years maybe five to ten years um, the European venture market will be much better because it's more versatile um, of course you have more languages but um, legal wise we are finding a structure which which will uh, be able to deploy in all the countries and so I think we are seeing things ca catching up faster in Europe at the moment than in the US. 
Awesome. That's that's great to hear. We do have some some great ideas around here. Any other companies that you would like to mention that you're excited about? Um, if you were to if you were to give me three that uh, have been on your mind recently that can really change something within the German startup ecosystem. In the German startup ecosystem, um, well, so as a seed VC, I always look into opportunities more than so when you hear of those larger runs today for me this uh, market trend is already gone as i want to see them right at the, at the beginning i think um, with regards to blockchain peer-to-peer -peer exchanges so whatever can be transferred between two people um, i see good ideas coming up from great founders who are making use of the blockchain you know not only like cryptocurrencies but really trying to connect people, putting a contract in between and um, yeah, getting rid of the intermediary. You know, the old story that has been in every white paper in the last two, 10 years is now coming really into place. So I'm really curious for what, what the future will bring in that area. So, uh, because to me, the blockchain will be as big roughly as the internet. And we are first, still in the first year. So it's like internet 19... I don't know, 96. So now you see the good companies finding their profile in that area. And um, I really, I'm really curious for companies in this, in this space in the next year. So for me, this, is, this can be a game-changing um, space. Mm. As an uh, entrepreneur in the blockchain space, I'm really happy you, you say that. Yeah, you see, um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's the reason why we are talking. <laughs> Let's uh, step back a little bit and uh, maybe jump into the topic. A lot of our listeners are, are young professionals, uh, even students in the in the space of finance, business, technology. And I bet many of them are asking question, how do I get a job as a VC? So we've heard your story. You've previously been with, uh, you've previously done investment banking uh, before going into the startup scene. Um, is that a traditional route, would you say, between your colleagues and, and people that you that you work with, or is this something else? Um, the traditional way, probably, I mean, if I look at my colleagues, I'm the only one who was in that um, working for startups, founding startup space so far. Many, many come also from consultancies and, and had some attachment to startups or to this way there. So when it comes to VC, there is basically no typical way. You could also be in chemistry for 10 years and then decide, well, I will do life science investments now. And this will also be true. Um, so that, that's maybe the great thing about the, um, the industry. There, there is no stereotype. You, know, you don't need to have a CVA or CVB to get an appointment. You just need to be a clear person. I think it's what's still most important. If you want to become a VC, you really need to want it because you like the job. So um, especially at the beginning, you're not worth a lot for the fund in terms of your knowledge. Because if you start, uh, VC is, is a lot of a lot about specialized knowledge, which no university can provide you. So I would, I would say, well, rather try to find, I don't know, a gap year, try to find a small analyst position and, and, build up that knowledge and then you you get um, valuable for the fund and then and then you can start doing your own investments for a VC fund. Mm. I would also want to touch upon because you've previously worked in private equity now you work in VC. What what do you feel the difference is? Mm. Uh, what are some major things for for people who are trying to decide between the two? Yeah. I mean uh, those private equity that was just an in it was just an internship so only a small um, um, experience on my side but what, what's the main reason private equity is more about numbers it's more investment banking style um, because also your clients are very different your clients are rather the 50 to 60 year old business owner probably owns still a lot in the company so it's a lot more old-fashioned in a way uh, more investment banking and um, also the, the 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 timeline of from investment to de investment is shorter, which is quite interesting. Many people think, well, those VC guys are in and out very fast and making making a lot of money because companies book. But 
uh, uh, grow so fast, but it's the other way around. So private equity has a, a shorter holding period than venture capital. And there's just more financial engineering involved. So you have companies with stable cash flow. You can add debt instruments. Also in, in private equity, you usually buy the whole company or at least a majority in the company. Whereas in venture capital, we always take minority stakes and usually that's how it works. So you buy 10% on the company and see where it goes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a different business. For us also, when we invest, we know there's a high probability that the company will fail. So you accept those failures. Whereas in private equity, um, if the company fails, maybe your whole fund fails. Uh, it depends how many investments you do, but generally you have only a few investments and you know they they all need to to make their money back. Whereas we have, let's say, a higher tolerance rate for failures. That's that's actually quite interesting. Also, that you mentioned, uh, there's quite a lot of research, I believe, on. Uh, the fact how uh, much longer the holding uh, of companies is in venture capital and private equity, which is very unexpected that uh, venture capital funds usually run longer than uh, the private equity funds. Yeah, yeah. and uh, th that's a lovely thing about the job. You know, For me, I hate selling a company because if you have a company and you know that it's good, well, you want to stay and, and until it goes public. You know, why, why sell to the next investor? That doesn't make sense then because... Um, If you're on the right track, then you should surf that wave until until the end. I mean, of course, there might be times when when the, the price is, is good or you, you see that you want to focus on other industries, other technology, and you feel that, well, you can't do everything, of course, and your portfolio is full, then there might be... A, Uh, might be good to, to sell one day but if you have a nice company in your portfolio um, um, we don't like to, we don't like to sell so that's also why for example our fund has a lifetime of uh, 15 years so look into other private equity funds they have much shorter life spans because we know well venture if it if it keeps up if it goes well it takes long mm. you know? And for example look at SAP uh, 10 years after their Uh, a foundation they had nearly 10 million euros in revenues so that just shows how long it takes to scale technology yes awesome Tobias uh, thanks very much for coming over this has been very insightful and yeah. my pleasure Lucas thank you very much <laughs> awesome we'll talk soon yeah cheers have a great cheers. day thank you for listening to the Wall Street Lab podcast for the show notes and much more visit us at www.thewallstreetlab.com To see what we're up to before anyone else, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast constitutes the opinions of individuals and should not be treated as investment, tax, financial or legal advice. We take no responsibility for the accuracy of any statements made in this podcast. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and it does not contain an offer to sell or buy any sort of financial products and should not be treated as advertisement for such. Any copying, distribution or reproduction of this podcast without the prior permission of the creators of the podcast is strictly prohibited.